My name is Joel Granja. I'm on the Spring Security team. Uh, thanks for having me out tonight, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Um, definitely, uh, we got a we got a mix of skills. Um, so I'm kind of curious. Uh, actually, I'll finish my introduction. So yeah, I'm on the Spring Security team. Um, been on the team for like seven years or eight years. I don't know. It's been a while. Uh, my main focus has been OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Started off with client support in 5.0 resource server support 5.1 and then the last three or it's going to be yeah like three and a half years spring authorization server super excited about this project um, we went 1.0 last november um, we're going to release 1.2 coming up um, great feedback on the project super happy about it looking to do some great things going forward so that's what we're going to talk about tonight um, and uh, yeah, so uh, just, just before I kind of start, I wanted to just ask the audience, like, who's a Spring developer here? If you could put your hand up. What? Spring developer. Okay. And uh, how about Spring Security? Okay, great. Have you tried Spring Authorization Server? Okay, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna definitely get into it. How about OAuth 2 Client and Resource Server and Spring Security? Okay, great, great. Okay, and what's your knowledge level of OAuth 2 OpenID Connect? I'm gonna say like, I'm gonna say from one to five, one being pretty low, five being advanced. Let's say, let's start at two. Anyone two and above? Okay, four? Okay, okay, cool. Just so I get a, an idea because I'm starting off with a couple slides. This is not gonna be slides. It's gonna be all code examples, right? But I'm gonna start off with some slides and just kind of get into things. And I have a branch with a lot of configuration scenarios, right? Um, definitely not gonna be able to go through it all, but at least you'll have the branch to check it out on your own, like valuable real world use case configuration scenarios that we're gonna go through, okay? Um, first off, let's start with this, right? What is Spring Authorization Server, right? Because um, some people confuse it, is this like a key cloak? Right? And no, right? Like Spring Authorization is ultimately a framework, right? That allows you to build an OpenID Connect provider or an OAuth 2 authorization server like Keycloak, right? Keycloak is a product, right? It is ready to go. You could use it in production, but it doesn't just implement all the OAuth 2 OpenID Connect um, protocol implementations, right? It has the, 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 the um, product features, right? A UI to administer clients, a UI to administer authorization so you could revoke tokens if a token was leaked, right? Um, integration with IDPs, whether it's LDAP, Active Directory, and so forth, right? So that's a product, right? An open ID, like, like a commercial product. He cloaks open source, but there's a lot of commercial products out there, right? Um, so Spring Authorization Server, it allows you to build that product as the foundational base. Ultimately, it implements <clears throat> the protocol implementations of OAuth 2, right, and OpenID Connect, and then you build on top of that, right? So that's what Spring Authorization is all about, right? So yeah, um, it's not a key cloak. It's not comparable to anything, really, right? So what are the use cases? Like, why would I use Spring Authorization Server over Key Cloak or Ping Identity or Okta, right? I mean, the biggest thing is, is if, you're, if you don't have application security experts on your team, do not use Spring Authorization Server. Really risky, right? Buy a product, right? Um, get the commercial support. When vulnerabilities happen, they're patched quickly. You need that, right, to be secure within your organization. However, there are some use cases, right? Um, there's definitely a couple of clients that, that, that I'm dealing with. They're building their own you know, OpenID Connect provider. They have, they have heavy customization, right? They got to they gotta connect to different business units that have different authentication mechanisms that are non-standard and so forth, right? Um, so if you need complete control and you need, you need an OAuth 2, an OpenID Connect provider, and you, ha you have advanced scenarios, connecting with different authentication systems, proprietary ones, you wanna implement your own custom extension grants, your own you know, client authentication mechanisms, like all these kind of things, then Spring Authorization Server is something you should look at, right? Um, 
Another scenario is, I mean, there's a lot of products out there, bells and whistles, there's a lot of features, and you use a tiny bit of it, right? Because ultimately, you're building OAuth 2 client applications, resource servers, you just want to leverage the OAuth 2 features, authorization code grant, client credentials, you want a client to get an access token, call a resource server, not too much more than that, right? So, and you want something more lightweight. Again, Spring Authorization Server might be, you know, that, that, that use case for you. Um, it's definitely easy during development. Instead of like, as a developer, I got to build an all 2 client application. Instead of installing and configuring open to source product or trying to get a license for a trial license for a commercial product, I could just download Spring Authorization Server. I'm going to show you coming up. I could just start it up really quickly. And then bang, I could start developing my OAuth 2 client application, right? Um, so these are the use cases, right, for Spring Authorization Server. Um, let's jump to, this is a great, a great place to start um, if you want to understand or if you want to know um, what, uh, what features are implemented. So this is the reference uh, manual here. If I go to the overview, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. This is a nice little... Uh, you know, chart of features, right? So here we have the uh, authorization grant features that have been implemented, right? Obviously the standard ones, authorization code, client credentials, refresh token, and we implemented in 1.1 the device grant, right? Um, and to the right are the specification links related to the feature implementations for, for convenience. Um, the token formats, you know, JWT opaque, different client authentication methods that are supported, you know, private key JWT, that's a, that's a pretty important one. And then all the protocol endpoints that are implemented, right? All the OAuth 2 standard ones, you know, authorization endpoint, token endpoint, introspect, revoke, right? And then open ID connect ones and so forth, right? So definitely check this out. If you're interested, go there, take a look, and you could see what, uh, what Spring Authorization Server is at with the current feature set. Okay, so, now we're just going to jump into, get rid of these slides, we're going to just jump into the demo. So I have this branch um, <clears throat> on the Spring Authorization Server repo. I'll go there right now. There's this sample, and this is the perfect place to start. If I go to the samples here, right, so this is the repository, um, and then it's just basically under samples. We just got, it's probably hard to see the left side there, eh? Okay, right over here, the samples, we have default authorization server demo, demo client message resource. So the default authorization server, absolute minimal configuration. That's where we're going to start with this, with, with, with this um, set of demos, and I'm going to progressively add customizations with like common configuration scenarios. But the, if you're interested, the demo one, uh, the demo authorization server, the, the intention of that sample is to to demonstrate all the features that have been implemented in Spring Authorization Server, right? So you could start that up, um, and that works with the client application, demo client, and then messages resource, which is a resource, one resource server. It just delivers messages. This is a basic sample. We're just looking to prove out the flows and show all the features, right? So, <clears throat> so what I'm going to start with is I'm going to start off with the default authorization server, the demo client application, and the message resource, and then we're going to progressively go through um, a few different scenarios, and I'll, and I'll explain which ones. So here we go, right? So the first thing is, is we'll start off with minimal configuration. The second one is Spring Boot 3.1 introduced auto configuration. I'm going to show you all the code that I'm adding in minimal configuration, the required components. I'm just going to delete all that, add, add Spring Boot properties, and it runs beautiful, right? So I'll show that to start off. And then, you know, customize protocol endpoints. So the OAuth 2 endpoint, or the token endpoint, the authorization endpoint, there's default URIs. If I want to customize that, you know, maybe I want to version the URI, I'm going to show you how to do that. Very easy one, right, to start off. And then this one, um, I want to add a custom claim to a JWT, right? 
this is obviously one of the biggest use cases, right? And, and one of the use cases is, okay, instead of using scope-based authorization, you know, typically resource servers are looking at the scopes associated to the, to the access token um, and, you know, doing authorization decisioning if the scopes are associated. But what if I want to do something different, right? What if I have a different authority model within my organization? Like I got permissions, right? I got different domain objects. So, you know, domain A.read, domain B, you know, whatever it is, because it's different for every organization. I want to be able to put that authority information into the JWT so that way it could, you know, configure the resource server to do more than just scope-based authorization. So that's the next one. Um, and then I kind of already talked about it. Okay, now that I have, I'm going to demonstrate um, the user logs in, the user belongs to certain roles, right? I want to get those roles as authority information into the JWT. Now I want to change the scope-based authorization on a resource server to authorize on the roles, right? So that's what I'm going to show, right? Um, how to do that. Then, okay, so JWT is the default token format. And it's used quite a bit, but not everyone wants to use that, especially in the public facing sites. You want to use an opaque token because you could easily decode a JWT. There's sensitive information in there because somebody by accidentally, you know, um, configured it. And now there's sensitive information. It could get leaked, right? Not to mention it's just information that could easily get decoded, right? So typically you do want to use opaque tokens on the outside of the firewall. So I'm going to show you how to configure opaque tokens. And then the same thing there, I want to get those authorities associated to the opaque token, just like we did with the JWT, now the opaque token. And then we're going to talk about why do we want to uh, configure short-lived JWTs. The biggest question I get is, how could I revoke a JWT? <laughs> oh man, I wish there was a standard out there. There still isn't that I'm, not, that I'm aware of. And there's ways to do it, but it's proprietary. But there's a simple way, simple best practice to do is just short-lived JWTs and I'll explain, I'll explain why. This next one, we probably won't get to it, but this is a valuable one. So implementing an extension authorization grant. And definitely this is one of the requirements, you know, you wanna maybe implement your own proprietary grant. How do you do that, right? Um, and then the last one is the provider configuration response on the OpenID Connect response. I wanna be able to put that extension grant in there, right? So clients could discover that it supports these grant types. Okay, there's a lot there, and there's no way we're gonna get into all of that, um, but we're gonna just see how it goes, and, uh, and we'll see how much we can get to. But the first few are, are the key ones. Okay, so um, let's start off with the, the actual minimum required configuration, and we're gonna talk about we're going to talk about, uh, let's see, can, can everyone see that in the back? Yep. Okay. Okay, so. Um, before we get to Spring Boot 3.1, <clears throat> there's a few required components, right? Um, two of the central components, even before I get to this one, is, I mean, I, I need, an authorization server needs a place, a repository, to store clients, client metadata, right? A client, client ID, client secret, dot, the grants type, grant types you could perform and so forth. Um, and then as a client proceeds through a flow, a client credentials flow or authorization code grant flow, that's a completed authorization, right? So authorization, you know, has to be stored somewhere too, right? So those are the two core um, services in you know, domain objects that, that we need to deal with as an authorization server, right? So here we have the registered client repository, right? So that's the repository that stores registered clients, right? So the registered client, as you can see here, common information um, or metadata, we have the client ID, the secret, the, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna start looking at this instead of my, because I keep going down. <laughs> um, and uh, you know the authorization grants it could perform, the redirect URIs that are registered, and the scopes it could request, and so forth, right? And we gotta configure it, because if a client tries to request a scope it's not configured for, it should get rejected, right? It can't just ask for any scope. It can't just perform any grant type, right? So this is all the key pieces of information um, that are registered with the client. And then the other thing I was talking about, the authorization service, right? 
let's just look at let's look at the representation of an OAuth two authorization. Make this a bit bigger. <clears throat> so after a client completes, let's say a client credentials flow, right, has an access token, an instance of this will get registered with the service, right? ID unique identifier. That's the registered client ID. The principal name is basically the unique name of the client, right? The client ID and the client credentials flow, but in authorization code grant flow, there's a resource owner. So that's basically the owner, right? The resource owner um, ID. Uh, uh, yeah, and then, the, then you have the authorization grant um, type that was performed, the scopes that were authorized, you know, when you get the consent screen, do you authorize this application to access this, 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 you know, and so forth. Um, and then tokens, right? So tokens, depending on the, Depending on the flow, like client credentials flow, there's going to just be an access token. But an open ID connect flow, it's going to be three tokens. There's going to be an ID token for the, the um, open ID connect flow. There's going to be an access token and potentially a refresh token as well, right? So this is the authorization data. So we've got the registered client repository, authorization server, two of the core central you know, services within an authorization server. So if we come back here now, We'll look at uh, the authorization service security filter chain. So <clears throat> in Spring Security, so Spring Authorization Server is built on Spring Security, right? Spring Security, um, you know, ultimately the end result of a Spring Security configuration is you have one or more security filter chains, right? You'll have at least one security filter chain that is configured for authentication, some, you know, like whether it's form login or LDAP, Active Directory, and so forth. And now we have if you're using Spring Authorization Server, you have a, um, an authorization server security filter chain, and in that chain is a bunch of filters that handle the protocol endpoints, authorization endpoint, token endpoint, introspect, revoke, all these things, right? All these filters. And some of these filters, and most of these filters require the registered client repository authorization service, authorization consent service. So this is like the minimal configuration. This, this OAuth 2 authorization server configuration has got applied default security. This just simple convenience method. You don't have to use it. You could explicitly configure it. Um, but ultimately what it does is, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're already familiar with um, in Spring Security, it's just setting it up, right? You know, just requiring authentication. It's just um, configuring CSERV because a lot of the, a lot of the um, protocol flows have like a state parameter that serves as a CSERV protection and so forth, right? And then this, this configuration here is if, a, if an unauthenticated request comes through, through, through the authorization security filter chain and it ends up coming to the authorization filter and it's unauthenticated, it just redirects to login. So it's ultimately redirecting to Spring Security's filter chain, right, where the authentication happens, right? And that's ultimately this other, this other, uh, configuration out here, default security fig. This is, you know, the spring security filter chain, right? Um, you know, I've got form login configured here, and I just got one user, right, for this demo, right? So this is the, the chain that handles the authentication and ultimately gets redirected to this chain if a request comes in unauthenticated on the authorization server one. So if I continue with this, you know, we got the authorization service, the authorization consent service. You'll see here some notes just using in memory. Um, there is a JDBC implementation. I got some notes here and so forth. And then the other main component is the J JWK source. So <clears throat> JWT has got to get signed, right? The ID token has to get signed. Um, access tokens have to get signed. Where did the keys come from? It comes from the JWK source, right? So this is a, this is a Nimbus API. And we're using Nimbus behind the scenes for all um, Jose, JavaScript object signing and encryption um, uh, you know, functionality. Um, and we're, the Spring Authorization Server requires that. You know, this is basically, as it says, you know, the source for JWKs, JSON Web Keys, right? JSON Web Keys, whether it's used to sign, encrypt, and so forth. Um, I'm just basically setting up, you know, one RSA key as a signing key at startup, and, 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 and that's it, right? But ultimately, you're going to get keys from your own key source, set up JWK source, and so forth. And that's pretty much it. Oh yeah, and this last one, authorization server settings. So this one here, 
<clears throat> you know, here we have basically, you know, a few things we could configure, right? The authorization endpoint, uh, URI, the device authorization, and so forth, right? These are basically, I want to configure the URIs or the issuer, right? The issuer as in the unique identifier of this authorization server instance, right? <clears throat> so there you go. So now what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to start this up. And I'm going to show you, we're going to go to the authorization server metadata endpoint um, uh, endpoint, and we're going to look at the capabilities of the default authorization server. So I'll go here, and I'll make this a little bit bigger. All right, so, so this is what clients and resource servers use, right? The metadata endpoint filter to discover the capabilities of the authorization server and self-configure itself, right? So this one by default with the configuration that I just showed you there, um, we have, you know, this year it gets resolved dynamically at runtime. Here's the authorization endpoint device, you know, a few different endpoints, the authentication methods that are supported, grant types that are supported, Right, and so forth, right? Now, you'll notice one thing. If I try to access the OpenID Connect provider configuration, oh, wrong one, All right? I'm getting this sign in because ultimately it's gonna be a 404, right? Because it's not actually enabled by default. So OpenID Connect, you gotta enable it. So that's the first thing we're gonna do. So let's do that. So by, by default, this is a straight up you know, authorization server. So I'm gonna just basically, I'm gonna check out a bunch of code because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bother trying to write all the code and make a bunch of mistakes. Um, and this is gonna be way more efficient. And I'm just gonna talk over the code. So this is what you gotta do to enable it automatically. This bit of code right here. All right. So right here, right, I'm basically accessing, <clears throat> so the OAuth2 authorization server configure, that is the root configure. If you're familiar with Spring Security, there's a bunch of configures that allow you to configure certain functionality. So this is the authorization server configure. And from there, there's a ton of configures, all related to, or all, all associated to its endpoint. You know, whether it's the authorization endpoint configure, token endpoint configure, Open ID Connect endpoint configure is kind of like a parent configure, and below there is all the Open ID Connect specific ones. So if I took a look at the Open ID Connect one, right, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger, and I'll go to the structure here. Oops, you probably yeah, you know I can't even see that. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'll just I'll go back to here. <clears throat> So as you can see here, oh, wait a second. As you can see here, there's a few, I'll make it a little bit bigger. If I wanna, so this is the authorization server one, so I could you know, configure the authorization endpoint, token endpoint um, with the OpenID Connect one. I should go back here. I'll go to, Over here, I could configure, you know, the provider configuration endpoint, you know, logout endpoint, client registration, and so forth, right? <clears throat> okay, so let me start this up right now. I'm going to restart this, and just with that, that one line, OpenID Connect is enabled. Now, we'll have the provider configuration endpoint, the user info endpoint, um, and uh, there's one more that I'm thinking. One of them's disabled by default, client registration, right? Because to be able to like register a client dynamically, that, that could be a security issue, right? You gotta make sure that's really protected because as a malicious user, if, if I could get to that endpoint and register a client and then ultimately, you know, set up you know, some attacks based on that, like, you gotta, be, you gotta be careful with that. So by default, it's disabled, right? Um, <clears throat> and I'm not gonna get to demoing that, but, but yeah, that, that's the only one that's disabled. Now, if I go back here to the OpenID Connect one, 
okay, now I could see it, right? Now I could see there's different capabilities, right? We could see the user info endpoint right here, the end session endpoint. So this is OpenID Connect logout. And uh, there's a couple more. And then, and then yeah, this is, this is related to, you know, the, the algorithm sign for the ID token, what's supported, and so forth, right? So there, there you have it, okay? So now, <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to get rid of all that code. I want to make it a lot more simpler. And then, you know, there comes Spring Boot, right? Spring Boot 3.0. Let's take a look, see how that looks like. I'm going to basically just check this out. And then I'm going to... And I'm going to show you the code right now, right? Right now, I had a couple of configurations there, all right? I'll close all these windows. I had the authorization server configurer <clears throat> and the default server security configurer. It's all gone, right? I literally just have this class here, right, the Spring Boot application. This is the key piece here, right, the application YAML. Let's take, let's take a look at this. Okay, so here I have my, my one user, right? automatically gets registered by Spring Boot. And these are the properties here, right? So all, you know, same, same information as, you know, the registered client information, um, you know, client ID secret and so forth. And, uh, and all my configuration there, right? So this is it. So now if I start this up, right, I'm gonna get the same behavior. Let's just double confirm, and then we're gonna start configuring things up. Let's go back to, I'm having a hard time seeing here, right? This is like the lighting. But my eyes are probably just, you know, kind of going. <laughs> What's that? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I, gotta, I have everything set up. Now that I have everything set up, what I wanna do is and I like to start in incognito windows whenever I do these demos, start fresh. I'm just gonna go over the sample quickly, right? And then from there, we're gonna start configuring, customizing, I make this smaller, right? You know, typical um, consent screen, you know, I got messaging client is the client ID um, that I have configured. You know, I've logged in as user one, you know, am I authorizing? you know, messaging client application to access my user profile information. You know, this is the open ID connect flow. Yes, now I'm logged in, right? So this application is very, very basic, right? You know, um, it got this authorized. So I wanna, this basically, okay, I wanna have a client. I wanna perform the authorization code grant. I wanna get a token and then I'm gonna call the resource server. The messages resource server returns messages, right? I'm gonna go through that flow. Right, and now it's re requesting message read, message write, right? Click on yes. Right, there's my messages. Yeah, it's very basic, right? Same thing with the client credentials. You can't really see it going, but I'll just put that on so you can see. Right, it calls it 200, same thing, right? But this is the client credentials flow. Still requests the same scope, so could call the resource server, right? So this is the sample, right? Very basic sample. Now, um, what are we going to do next? Okay, so let's, let's customize the protocol endpoint URIs. I want to probably version the token endpoint, the authorization endpoint, you know, ultimately version, you know, my specific Spring Authorization Server instance, right? So, and there might be other reasons, maybe just want a different URI. How do I, how do I go about doing that? So let's show that. Um, I'm just going to check that bit of code out and then we'll just jump to it. So now I had to kind of restore my authorization server configuration file. Um, and this is it, right? This is pretty, pretty basic, right? The authorization server settings, right? So Spring Boot automatically registers that bean for you with the default URIs. If I want to customize, this is all I got to do, right? I'm only customizing a few of the endpoints here. Um, I could do all of them, but I'm just going to do these for now, and I'm going to show you 
by you know, um, discovering um, with the OpenID Connect pro provider configuration. The one thing I wanted to point out here, most of these are, I'm just gonna put something in there now. Most of these are uh, endpoints, actually all of them are endpoint URIs except for this one, issuer, right? So this is the issuer, this is the unique identifier of the OpenID Connect provider, if it's an OpenID Connect provider, but if you're just running up a, running a straight OAuth2 authorization server, then it's, it's still the issuer of the authorization server metadata, right? Um, and ultimately, you know, this, is, this relates to the domain or the host name, right, of the instance. You don't really need to set it because it's dynamically discovered at runtime. Um, but maybe you have a registered domain name for your specific open ID, you might want to set it. But you don't need to. But that, I just wanted to explain that this was the, um, the only difference with the authorization server settings. But ultimately, this is going to be a place where we'll keep growing um, settings that need to, uh, that need to be um, configurable. OK, so let's, let's, re let's restart that. Oh, where am I? Did I, uh, oh yeah, there it is, okay. I'm gonna restart this and then let's take a look at the provider configuration. Go back here. Then you can see here, right? You could see the authorization endpoint, right? It's versioned, token endpoint. So the changes took effect, right? So that's pretty easy, right? And, you know, I didn't, I'm not gonna show, show this next, but, I could, I could have just defined that in the Spring Boot properties and not defined that being, right? But yeah, go ahead. At that point, can we configure the well-known endpoints as well? Like, like the path for the well-known? Exactly, yeah. You know what? Um, so the, with the specification, that is always the suffix, well-known open ID, right? And nothing in the specification says you could customize it, right? And we try to, like, we're always going against the specification or with the specification. We try to allow hooks, right, so you could customize it. Nobody's requested that. Right now, you can't do it, right? Um, so, yeah, it, that, that's the standard <laughs> suffix path. <laughs> okay. Um, so that, that's the first one. So that's pretty, that's really easy, right? So now let's jump into something more advanced. This is a big one, right? Is, so I wanna add authority information into my JWT because I wanna do something other than scope-based authorization on my resource servers. So here's a use case like I mentioned earlier. And this is a common one and, and it might not be, you know, a realistic one. I mean, it probably is, but, you know, we're all used to role-based authorization. You know, who's in this role? Who's in that role? You know, when it comes to well, to client applications, less so. But I'm going to still go with that because it just applies across the board for anything, how you would do it, right? Depending on your authority information. So I'm gonna set up a use, my user here, I'm gonna give them user, I'm gonna give the person user and admin. And I want that user admin role to go in to an authority's claim in the JWT. That's the first step. Then the second step is on the resource server side, I want the resource server to, to perform authorization decisioning on the authority's claim and those specific values. So how do we go about doing that? Okay, so again, I'm gonna check out, check out this code here. Um, okay, this one here. First I'll kinda I'll go over it. Then I'll restart it. Okay, so right here, the token customizer. Actually, before I even get to that, I will go to <clears throat> the documentation here. This is another really good place to start for documentation, okay? Is uh, the way we got things set up here, um, you know, obviously the getting started and so forth. Configuration model, right? So this is kind of what I'm doing right now. What's the default configuration? How could I customize it? The two big, big ones are core model components and protocol endpoints, right? So if I go to the core model components, you know, you know I already kind of talked about a couple of them, registered client repository authorization, um, service, consent service. I didn't talk about this one though, the token generator, right? So the token generator you know, another core service, right? It's, 
it generates tokens. Like it could generate any kind of token, just the way the interface has been designed. By default, it, there's two implementations, JWT, a J, oh, sorry, um, a JWT generator, a refresh token generator, and then an opaque token generator. Those are the, the three default implementations. But if I needed to in my organization, and this is where I'm kind of coming back to, is, is uh, maybe have custom token formats, right? I could easily implement my own OF2 token generator, plug it in into a composite, and then utilize that token generator to, to, to mint my tokens, right? You got full flexibility, right, um, with, with this abstraction. The OF2 token generator, it uses an OF2 token customizer, right? I wanna be able to customize that token. Before that token generator actually mints the token, I wanna customize the claims by either adding claims, maybe removing some of the default ones, um, or just modifying it. I have full control, right? So basically what I gotta do in my application is I need to register an OAuth2 token customizer to add authority information, right? So now let's go back to the code example and let's take a look at it. Right, here's my OAuth2 token customizer, right? And you see it takes a generic type, right? Because I was mentioning earlier, depending, there's certain token generators. This one, this one is, is gonna get wired into the JWT token generator, right? Because the JWT encoding context. That encoding context or that token context object, it has JWT specific information, as in the headers, right? The Jose headers and the claims, right? Um, for, for an opaque token, it would be a different, um, different uh, context object, and we're gonna get to that. So, in the context object, there's, there's a few different things in here, right, that I can inspect, you know, and, and I'll get to that, but like, as you can see here, first I wanna, I wanna modify access tokens only. So, so I got that if statement there, okay. Is this token that's about to get generated by the generator, is it an access token? If it is, okay, I wanna do something, right? Um, and then I come in here, and as you can see, what I'm doing here is I'm grabbing the, uh, in the context, I have the principle, right? And this is ultimately the, authentic the, the authentication instance. So I just logged in, right, under user one, right? And I think it's a username and password authentication token. Um, and then I got, I got roles associated, right? Admin user, right? So I wanna get that the currently authenticated principle, I wanna get the authorities associated with it, and then I wanna read those authorities and, and, and basically you know, add it as a claim, right? So that's what's happening here, right? I'm reading the authorities from the, the authentication instance and just getting a string, right? Set, set string, and then I'm adding it to the claims just like that, right? So that's it, that's all I gotta do to add new claims in there. So let's see this actually working. I'm gonna run this. And then we'll inspect the JWT and we'll see that it's there. And I didn't bother showing it, but in the application YAML, I added, a, uh, I added user and min for roles, right? So you, you'll see that coming in. Okay, let's start this up. I wonder if there's a way to you know, just start all the instances up with one button in IntelliJ, but. Yeah, I just learned that. Is there? You can put them in a folder. Yeah. And you can rerun the whole folder. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna look that up, because that would be a lot more convenient. Because there's always at least three applications that I'm dealing with, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go in here. Um, I'm gonna open up a new incognito window. I'm just gonna log in again here, and then we'll go through the authorization code grant flow. And then we're gonna take a look at the token. Okay, so here's a token. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got a convenience method here for the JWT, or JWT.io. And as you can see here, there it is, right? Authorities. And this is how Spring Security stores it by default, uses that role prefix, right? So I got role admin, role user. So now I have this JWT, I got a custom claim in there. Now I could actually use that information to perform authorization decisioning, 
Okay, so let's jump to the next step, right? On the resource server side. What, how do I do that on the resource server side? Okay, so let's, let's check that, that code out here. And let's take a look at it. This, this is a little bit more involved, and I, I will admit, you know, I think we gotta make this a little bit easier so I could write less code as a developer. Um, but this is what I needed to do, right? So on the resource server side, this resource server right now is accepting JWTs only, right? So I've configured it with JWTs. I gotta configure with this authentication converter, right? So in a nutshell, What's happening here, this, this JWT authentication converter, what's, it's a converter, right? I'm getting a JWT, I gotta convert it to an authentication instance, right? So I have this JWT, I got authorities claim in there. Ultimately, I wanna create a JWT authentication token or an authentication instance, let's just say, with authorities that have what, what is, you know, what's, what's listed in the authorities claim, right? That's what this is doing without kind of getting into all the code here. That's what this is doing, right? And if I put a breakpoint, you know, kind of right here, and this is running, so I can't do anything here, um, but I'm gonna make this fail first. I had scope messages, right? I'm gonna take that out, so I, I don't wanna do scope-based authorization anymore. And, and I'm expecting role user, I'm gonna just do one, right? Um, to make it fail. And then I'm gonna start everything up again. Uh, I think I just have to restart this one. And what I'm expecting to happen right now is I should get a 403 forbidden. Let's, let's see. Uh, where am I here? Okay. Go back here. Actually, before I do that, um, so authorities here, as you can see here, the JWT is coming in and then it translates that, right, to um, the four, translates it back to the four, uh, you know, granted authority instances. Now, I'm gonna let this run through. I'm gonna go back here and there, there we have it, right? So this is forbidden, right? So it's, you know, it's working, right? We've, we've protected the resource. Now, let's just confirm though that we actually did change it from scope-based authorization to role-based, right? I'm gonna change this back to the correct authorization rule, and then I'm gonna restart this. What's the time check so far? Um, wrap up in about 30 minutes. 30, oh, okay, good, good. Okay, so here, so I'm gonna go back here and there, now I could see it, right? So that's, that's pretty, that's, you know, on the spring authorization server side, I think it was pretty easy to add a custom claim. On the resource server side, I, you know, yeah, I think we gotta do some improvements there. But anyways, there, it's endless. <laughs> um, okay, <clears throat> so we kinda whipped through I'm going very fast and I'm talking fast because I'm trying to get everything done. But if anyone has any questions, interrupt me. And I hope I'm not going too fast. Hopefully it's not too, okay. Um, so I, I, I've gone through all of that, right? So now let's go to the next one. So now what I wanna do is, so I have two clients, right? One that's performing the authorization code grant, another one that's doing the client credentials grant. They're both, um, they're both using JWTs. I'm gonna change the authorization code one to use opaque tokens. I'm gonna leave the client credentials one with JWT, I'm not touching it. I'm gonna ch change the authorization code client to use opaque tokens. Let's show you how to configure that, okay? And how token introspection works. And ultimately, I wanna be able to associate um, those authorities that I did with the JWT to, that, to the opaque token. Because there is a way, just because it's opaque, you know, doesn't mean there's no information associated with it. You have to just go to the token introspection endpoint on the authorization server and it will return pretty much all the same information that is in the JWT, but there's a couple other extra bits of information. <clears throat> so let's do that. Let's configure <coughs> opaque usage. 
Okay, I'm just gonna check this one out first, and then we're gonna we're gonna go over. You know, how would I do that? I'm gonna just open up the relevant these ones, and then I want to do that one. Okay. Okay. So let's start off with let's start off with uh, uh, yeah this one here. Okay. So this is my Spring Authorization Server configuration, the messaging client, that's the original one. And what I've done here, I've created a new one, right? And I've given it this unique identifier, you know, message client opaque, right? Um, give it a different client ID, client secret. Um, everything else is pretty much the same. Nothing much different other than this one key one down here, token. All right here I hit access token format reference, right? The two, the two values that are valid are reference and self-contained, right? Those are two, the two values. And there's a few things I could do here. Um, I could do, you know, authorization code time to live setting, um, access token time to live. I'm going to get to that, but I could set time to live for all the various tokens and a few different things. Um, and I'm going to get to that later. Um, but that's really, you know, the only difference. I create a new client registry, now I got two clients registered to the authorization server. Um, one, and, but this one's, you know, only, only um, uh, dealing with opaque tokens, right? And now on the, on the, uh, the client side, and I haven't showed you all of this yet, but it's similar to the authorization server side, because on the, on the client side, we, the representation of a client is client registration, right? On the authorization server side, it's registered client, right? You know, it's a registered client. But on the, on the client side, it's client registration, but they're, anal they're, like, they're the same, right? But ultimately, it's registered with the authorization server. You could consider this as client metadata, right, on the client side that it needs to be able to perform the flow. I mean, the biggest thing here is provider, the issuer URI. I mean, the, all of these clients will use this and it'll discover all the capabilities, self-configure itself and so forth, right? But you're probably gonna want to, um, I mean, you need to, you know, somehow rich, uh, uh, set the secret. I mean, obviously you're not going to do it like this in production. You're going to get the secrets from, you know, secure source and so forth, right? Um, but, you know, you know, just to continue here and without getting too much on the client side of things, this is the authorization code one, right? That, that I had configured that was working. I changed these two things, right? So now I changed the client ID and the secret, right? So the new client I identifier, right? So it's going to use that one right now, right? So that was the one change. And then on the resource server side, I'm setting up the opaque, the introspection endpoint, the client ID secret. Because ultimately, there's a client on the resource server side that calls the OAuth2 token introspection endpoint to get the claims, right? So that's the other configuration. Yes? I have a question just for the introspection endpoint. Does that require additional authentication or do you just pass a token and that's all you need? No, no, yeah, it's, it's the same. Like you could, you could configure, um, you know, client speaker basic, um, post, private key, or you could customize it completely. Okay. Yeah, with Spring Authorization Server, you could add your own client authentication method. You still gotta configure it on the resource server side, right? And there's gotta be the capability. But, and, and with these properties, it's limited. Right, but if you programmatically create that o opaque token introspector, that's the abstraction, then you could do some customizations there. But this is limited with the properties. It's, it's client, it's, you know, um, uh, client secret basic, that's it. Okay, so, so that's, that's it, right? That's, that's what I've done. Now, if I start this up. Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Anyone else? Oh, I was going to ask, but like at Go the for time it. of introspection, we can also revoke the token as well at that point in time, right? You know what? I'm going to show that next. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Because it's kind of related to JWTs and you want them short-lived. I'm going to show how I authorize two of, the, two of the tokens and I'm going to revoke them right away, but I could still use the JWT. 
right? Can't write, right? So, so what do you do, right? Anyways, I'll get to that. Um, <clears throat> okay, now that I got this started up, and I just got to start a new one. <clears throat> I just want to confirm, right, that we are actually using an opaque token for the authorization code grant. Okay, so I'll perform, I'll do the client credentials first. Oh, uh, let me see. Oh yeah, you know what? I did some, let me see here. Yeah, I remember what happened there. The, when I changed the authorization rules, the client credentials doesn't have authorities, right? Because the client credentials, there's no user associated. So that, all that authority mapping that I had, that authorities is, it's not there in the token. So that's kind of why, um, <clears throat> that's why it uh, failed. Because if I, I just reset it back, you'll see here, okay, I got scope message read is back because that client credentials, it's just got the scopes, right? So I've restarted back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna restart this, or just the resource server. And then we'll go back, and hopefully it's started up by now. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so there's the client credentials. We know this is a JWT or else it wouldn't decode it, right? Um, now let's go with the authorization code grant. Go through the flow. As you can see, message client opaque. It's using the right one. We'll submit this. Much smaller token. I do not see two dots there that delimit a J assigned JWT. Click on that, it doesn't decode it. So we know this is an opaque token, right? Okay, so now, what we need to do, and because there's a few things I want to talk about, and I'm probably just going to skip ahead with a couple, couple, couple of the other commits here. Um, I'll just check this out and kind of go over it really quickly. <clears throat> Actually, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to bother with that because that bit of code here, the resource server configuration, and I'll just show really quickly. Right, so the opaque token, just, just like we had an authentication converter with the JWT, right? We gotta, um, we gotta, we, we ultimately gotta, you know, supply an authentication instance, right? So the resource server could look at, or, or ultimately really Spring Security could look at the authorities associated with that authentication instance. We had to do that with the JWT converter. Um, same thing with the opaque token converter. I got that code there for JWT. This, this is the one here, right? So this converter, right, it basically takes in the introspective token, then it's got this authenticated principle, right? This is ultimately what come, when that OS2 token introspection call comes back, right, by the, by the opaque token authentication provider, when it makes that call with, that, with the client credentials that I just showed you there, um, it comes back with this instance, an OS2 authenticated principle. And in there are attributes, as you can see here. Here's the principal, right? I'm getting the, you know, issued at time, expired time. Um, and then here, this is where I'm extracting the authorities. As you can see here, um, we have, you know, I'm getting the, the scope claim and the authorities claim, right? So these are the authorities, you know, we want to associate as well with, with the opaque access token. Okay, so that, that was that. And again, this code, yeah, I'm not, I'm not digging it. I wish it was easier, but that's what we got so far. <laughs> um, okay, so the interesting thing to note here though, right? And I wanna point this out. And this is, this is another thing I think we could, I mean, this is, I mean, th there's definitely use cases for resource servers needing to support more than one token format right? More than just the JWT and opaque token. 
Like really, you ultimately want the flexibility. Because if you, like a, like a large scale deployment, you could have JWTs, opaque tokens, custom tokens, you know, flying around in your OAuth landscape, right? That were all minted from the authorization server. And you have these resource servers, like you gotta figure out, if you gotta, if you gotta restrict which clients can call what resource servers based on a token format, that would be very limiting and very complicated from a configuration scenario. So you want the resource server to be configurable to support any token format that the, that the authorization server mints, right? Um, so let's, let, me, let me show something here, right? Right now, I have opaque token um, uh, introspection configured on the resource server, but as you guys all know, and, and, and ladies, um, this is not the be it's not the most performant, right? Because you've got to do the extra hop, right? Typically, use JWT JWTs inside the firewall, and then outside the firewall, hopefully, but likely you don't. <laughs> In a lot of cases, you use an opaque token. A lot of times, it's just JWTs all over the place, right? Um, but that that's the ultimate. Um, scenario you want to go to but you know you get that extra hop right um you want to limit that if you want if you if you need something performance now in this well, what i have here right now is i got jwt and uh i'm gonna well, token provider okay so this is the authentication provider that receive ultimately receives a request indirectly for token introspection, right? And it'll return the claim. So I'm gonna put a breakpoint here because I wanna show you something that happens with this scenario here. So I'm gonna to go to, get to log in again. Okay, so. Uh, okay. I didn't see that breakpoint there. Um, oh, what to, well, that's ref oh, I'm totally, yeah, I'm like, I cannot even token intro. Okay, there it is. Okay, I'm gonna put a breakpoint here. Now, I'll go through this again. Authors, okay, I got the breakpoint. So it's calling the introspection endpoint, right? Okay, great, that's what I expected. Now, look what happens with the client credentials now. It's calling the introspection endpoint. That's not at all what I expected, right? It's valid. Like a JWT could get called, any token could, could get passed to the introspection endpoint. It is valid and, and it's to spec, but that's not what you want, right? Ultimately, you, you're using JWTs I mean, for a number of reasons, one of them is for performance, right? Authorization happens, you know, at the, at, you know, at the resource server, right? Without that extra hop, right? So what I would have to do now <clears throat> is I have to configure the resource server to support both, right? So that's the next little bit of code here that I'm gonna show you. And this is also another area, you know, before I kind of even get to it is that we could improve on because I did have to write a bit of code for this that I would like to have not. And I'm, I'm gonna show it a little bit. I'm not gonna get too much into it, but I'm gonna share this branch with you guys um, and ladies. I keep saying guys, don't, don't get offended. I always say guys to everybody. <laughs> um, you'll see here, authentication manager resolver. Before I had <clears throat> opaque token, well, first I had JWT. Then it changes to opaque token. Now it's authentication manager resolver, right? It resolves a specific authentication manager based on um, the material in the request, whatever that may be, right? What I've done here is, I got this one little helper, is JWT, right? I'm actually inspecting the request, I'm getting the bearer token, and then I'm inspecting to see if it's got two dots, because a signed JWT has two dots. You got the header, you got the claim, and you got the signature, right? Is this production ready? No. <laughs> like, you probably want something else. You probably want something, um, like you could, you could determine, like for example, here's another use case. You could have all your internal um, calls, 
in a, in a specific URI pattern, right? Could be slash internal, could be in there. You might just do that, right? Um, and inspect that because, you know, based on your architecture guidelines, you know, and how things have been implemented, these are the specs. So you could do that, right? But ultimately, you know, what I'm doing here is if it's a JWT, then go to the JWT authentication manager. If it's opaque, then go to the opaque manager, right? That's ultimately what I'm doing. There's a bit of code here, this setup here. I'll let you look at this, you know, because I'd rather kind of go through the scenarios, but I'll let you guys look at that. But just so we could, uh, you know, prove this out, that it's not actually, you know, when we're doing the, when we're doing the, what's, oh yeah, resource server. When we're doing the calls, the introspection endpoint is only getting called with the opaque token. So let's try this. Okay. So authorization code. Okay, yes, I expected that. Breakpoint. Client credentials. There, right? So it didn't get called. So now I've now I have a resource server supporting two tokens and not reducing the performance on the JWT authorization decisioning. Before I jump to the next one, how much time do I have? Uh, nine minutes. Okay, so I'll, you know what? Um, let me see what else I could squeeze in here. Okay, let's just finish off with this because this will be an easy one. Okay, so we have, I can't, like how could I revoke a, Okay, I'll do this here. How can I revoke a JWT? That one is, that is a, a big question. <laughs> you know, and there are a lot of proprietary ways, like for example, um, when a token revocation happens, right, on the authorization server, the authorization server, if it knows all its resource servers, could push the JTI, the you know, identifier of JWT, to all the resource servers. So the resource servers have a cache of JTIs to revoke, right? And then when a J, when JWT comes in, it, it looks it up. Okay, is this revoked? Okay, right? But, you know, that's proprietary, right? Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, the easiest way, I would say, to, you know, minimize your attack time, right? Because ultimately, uh, you know, a JWT gets leaked, malicious client could use it, it could use the resource server. Well, if the JWT is valid for two hours, then you got two hours of attack time, right? So you wanna have really short lived JWTs, right? Like even just one minute, right? If it has a refresh token, right, the client, then even after a minute, it'll refresh the token. But that's where, that's the key right there is, if you have a leaked JWT, right? Okay, it's valid until it expires, but that malicious client will not be able to renew that token if the refresh token is also revoked, right? So that's the best practice is for JWTs that are flying in the public or actually just in general, because refreshing a token, no big deal, right? Um, just keep it short lived, right? So I'm gonna just show you that and then I'll wrap up with a couple of things. And that, that one's an easy one. Um, that one is basically, if I come back to the, <clears throat> my properties here, and I just show you this, go back here and there it is. I, actually, I already kind of showed you that earlier, right? So I've configured access to time to live 90 seconds, right? Um, there's a there's a clock skew for one minute, so technically, it'll actually expire in 30 seconds. Um, and uh, you know, I could do that. I could do that demo of revoking. You wanted it. Um, let's just do it. How much time we got? Yeah, we're good. We can do it. Okay. Okay. So let's let's do this. Okay, I got to sign in again. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of that breakpoint. Come back here. Okay, so I just authorized the authorization code, the client credentials, so I authorized both. Now I'm gonna revoke both. Okay, I'm gonna revoke authorization code client, client credentials. 
Now, opaque token is being used, right, for authorization code. This is definitely what I expected because it went to the token introspection endpoint, came back with inactive, I think, in, or active false or whatever, right? So good. But plain credentials, I could still access it like I was talking about, right? Now keep an eye on that token, right? I'm gonna try to access it again and that'll, that'll be different in like 10 seconds um, or 20 seconds or whatever. And so that's the key is, okay, I'm the attacker. I can still access this, right? But only for 30 seconds if I've configured it that way because ultimately I revoke the refresh token, right? Because this will, this will renew that access token with a refresh token and I'll get a new access token, right? But if I revoke the, if I revoke the refresh token as well and I'm gonna click on this and you see the token did change, right? I wouldn't be able to access it. Then I get four bit, four bit in there. So I have 30 seconds, right? So that's the best practice, right? Um, yeah. I so, can tell a very short story, which is we had one hour tokens. We implemented revocation. And we had months of pain because all of our clients weren't very good at refreshing tokens on the fly. If we'd taken your advice at the beginning, yeah. there wouldn't have been any pain because they all would have been good at refreshing tokens already. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's definitely it's a you know a combination of you know axe token time to live, then allowing a refresh token, but also refresh token time to live, and even reusing refresh tokens. Right? Do you want to? You know, so it's a, it's, a, it's there's a combination there, right? And it depends on your use case. There's a couple other things that I want to talk about. I'm not going to get to it, and these are definitely pretty advanced. But the code is there implement an extension grant type. People ask about this too, right? Because you know you might have your own proprietary way of, of giving tokens and your own proprietary way. So you could do that, right? I've implemented, I've called it, you know, custom code grant, right? It's similar to the authorization code. You know, I get a one-time code. However I get it is irrelevant, um, but it's been implemented in the token endpoint configured. So you could take a look at that. And that, that last piece there, um, I implement a new grant type. I want that to come back on the the OpenID Connect provider configuration response, right? So that's that's the other thing. That's pretty much it. Um, so that, that's that's uh, you know the the Spring Authorization Server repo. There's the demo branch. I'm going to distribute this PDF, right? And then you yeah. can distribute to everyone else, so they have all this information. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then. These how-to guys, we're building them, right? You know, people are always asking, right? Obviously, it's a lot easier to, you know, to, instead of having a, a million samples out there, we're putting together these how-to guides um, on different scenarios. And definitely some of the stuff that I did here is gonna go into those how-to guides. Um, so that's it, that's, that's all I got. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Thank you very much.